Chairman Loeb, Ranking Member Andrews, and members of the committee and the subcommittee, thank you for your invitation to appear here today. My name is Elizabeth Reynolds, and I'm a shareholder in the law firm of Allison, Slutsky, and Kennedy, PC, in Chicago, Illinois. Since joining the firm in 1998, I have represented unions, and that's what this hearing is about, make no mistake, are serving the narrow interests of the 1%. Ms. Uh, Reynolds, I just want to make sure I've got this right for the record. Is it your testimony that Chairman Rowe and I and others who have expressed concerns about the NLRB acting right now and when their uh, constitutionality is challenged are, quote, serving the narrow interest of the 1%? Is that, is that your testimony? Well, uh, Mr. Klein. Sort of yes or no. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Klein, Thank that you. is serving those interests. Thank you. Reclaiming my yeah. time. Um, that's extraordinary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to, first of all, Ms. Reynolds, thank you for your opinion about when the, the Senate is in session. I think that we'll have to, uh, to see what Senator Reid and Senator McConnell think about that. But uh, this argument is being reframed by your testimony, and this administration has a, has a problem of making end around Congress uh, when they don't agree uh, with what Congress does, and that approach is definitely meant to paralyze the legislative process, which is what's happening. So uh, right now I find it very ironic that the administration and their allies on the committee, as well as your testimony, challenging Republicans about these NLRB appointments based on policy disagreements when the really the argument is not about that. If these uh, appointments were consistent with historical constitutional precedent, uh, that we wouldn't be having this hearing today. We not only uh, have to look at Ms. Reynolds' testimony in the administration's recent attack on the First Amendment rights to religious freedom to see what the tactic is, and we're on to you. Reframing the discussion will not take this away from the facts that this is a constitutional issue, and we will continue to stand up for the Constitution. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I want to uh, give the rest of my time to Mr. Gowdy. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Ms. Reynolds, who's Miguel Estrada? Have you ever heard of him? Uh, I believe he's a circuit court judge, if my uh, recollection is correct. I, I actually don't think so. Uh, I, I, I apologize. I may be wrong. Well, I, I think you are. and This is why mm -hmm. his name entered my mind. Uh, when my friend, and he is mm -hmm. my friend, Mr. Andrews, was asking you about regular order, Miguel Estrada's name went through my mind. Uh, he was someone who was denied a vote for the D.C. Court of Appeals, if I'm not mistaken, uh, even though he had plenty of votes to pass uh, in the full Senate, uh, he couldn't even get a vote. And I was stunned that you weren't able to mention that while y'all were discussing Mr. Bork. If you would, if you have an opportunity to uh, look up the case of Miguel Estrada, uh, I'd be grateful to you. Uh, do you agree with me that the Constitution means the same thing, whether there's a Republican in the White House or a Democrat in the White House? I absolutely do. Did you object uh, when Harry Reid was having these pro forma sessions when President Bush was in the White House? Nobody asked my opinion at that you time. Did you write any law review articles on it? I'm sorry, no, I did not write any law review articles. Did you write articles. any columns in, in any trade magazines on it? No. So you only give your opinion when it's asked. You don't ever just decide, hey, this is wrong. I'm going to write a law review article or, a, or an op-ed piece and criticize the fact that the Senate is engaging in this travesty to thwart appointments. I'm usually too busy practicing law to write op-ed pieces. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy practice of law to come today. Uh, what is uh, your definition of a recess? I would prefer not to opine on that. I'm a labor lawyer, not a constitutional scholar. Well, ma'am, you can't have it both ways. You can't come and testify on a hearing about recess appointments and then decline to, to answer the, the uh, seminal question, which is what is a recess? If they were to take a nap, which happens from time to time in the U.S. Senate, is that a recess? <laughs> Well, my understanding was that I was asked not, not to testify about recess appointments, to, but to testify who, who about asked, the effect of the Noel Canning decision. You, who in the world asked you not to testify about something? No, that I was not asked to testify about that, but that, that the, the topic of the hearing is the future of the NLRB, what Noel Canning versus NLRB means for workers, right, and that, employees, and unions. And that union. very case yeah. dealt with recess appointments, so mm -hmm. you can understand why I would ask you mm -hmm. What's your definition of a recess? 
I don't have one to offer at this time. But you agree it should be the same thing whether there's a Republican in the White House or a Democrat in the White House? Certainly. And would you also agree that when the Senate passes something like the payroll tax extension, uh, did, did anyone challenge that as being outside the normal course of Senate business, that, that, that they weren't uh, legally constituted to pass that payroll tax extension? I'm not aware of any challenges to that. So how can you be in session for purposes of passing a bill, but not in session for purposes of making a recess appointment? I'll leave that to the constitutional scholars to argue. Well, what's your opinion? In my opinion, the appointments were proper. Wow. Um, I'm almost out of time. I hope that I will uh, have another chance to go with you through the chronologies of when these appointments were made. Let me just ask you this. I'll go ahead and give you a couple of the questions up front so you can think about them. Do you know who controls the calendar in the Senate? I am not an expert on Senate procedure. Would you be surprised if I told you the Democrats did? I would not be surprised to hear that, but I am aware that the House uh, prevented the Senate from adjourning more than three days at a time during that the time that this was occurring. That actually wasn't my question, mm -hmm. but we'll get back mm -hmm. to my question when it's mine. Okay. Next uh, time. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Reynolds, Peter Schomburg's term ex expired August 22nd, uh, 27, 2010. Do you know when the President nominated Terrence Flynn to fill that vacancy? I believe it was in January of 2011, if I recall correctly. Which helped me with math. Uh, that would be, what, four or five months later? It sounds about right. Would you agree the timeliness of a nomination to replace can be some evidence of the importance of the vacancy itself? I'm sorry, could you re repeat the question? The length of time it takes one to propose a replacement, would you agree that that could be evidence of how significant the vacancy was in the first place? Not necessarily. I assume the President has many things that he's considering. Um, so five, five months is, is a reasonable <laughs> amount of time in your judgment to, to wait to make an appointment to something as important as the NLRB. Do you know, again, who controls the schedule in the Senate? I've already stated that I don't. Um, would you disagree with me if I told you it was the Democrats? I wouldn't disagree. Uh, do you know who controls the scheduling of committee hearings in the Senate? I assume that it would be the majority, but I don't know specifically how that works. And the majority would be the Democrats, right? Correct. Do you know when Harry Reid scheduled a vote on Terrence Flynn? No. Would you be surprised to know he didn't? I don't know. Would you be surprised to know we did? I really, I, I, I don't know what the, whether that occurred or not. And you don't know whether you would be surprised or you don't know whether it happened or not. It didn't happen. So what my question to you is, are you surprised that the leader of the Senate never scheduled a vote on one of the NLRB replacement appointees? I don't know enough about the circumstances to uh, know whether that's surprising or not. Wilma Liebman's term expired August 27, 2011. Do you know when the President nominated Richard Griffin to fill her vacancy? I believe that was in December of 2011. And I would point out that immediately, or very shortly after these recess appointments were made, uh, all three of the appointees were nominated again, uh, and uh, the Senate still would not allow an up or down vote on them. Which kind of gets us back to the Miguel Estrada question, doesn't it? Whether or not the, the same tactics are acceptable when there's a Republican administration uh, versus a Democrat administration. Let me ask you about Craig Becker, because it looks like his term expired on January the 3rd, 2012. Do you know when the president appointed Sharon Block to fill that vacancy? Uh, the following day, I Do you believe. think one day is enough time for the Senate to perform its constitutionally mandated function of advice and consent? There had been a nomination of Ms. Block the previous month, but the advice and consent uh, was, was not – there was – the a, the Senate was not able to fulfill its, its uh, advice and consent function because of the fact that the nominations were being uniformly put on hold. My, my, my question to you is, says who? I mean, who says the Senate wasn't able? You agree with me not doing something is different from not having the power to do something. Was there a vote scheduled on any of these three nominees by Democrat leader Harry Reid? 
I believe that that was not possible. And I'm not, it's, I'm not citing myself. I'm citing uh, Senator Graham. Not possible. Sen Senator, Senator Graham, Graham pledged, in his own words, to block Senate confirmation of nominees to the board. So Senator Graham writing in a press release that he pledged mm -hmm. to do something mm -hmm. carries just as much weight as the majority leader in the Senate who has control over the calendar, who never if, if, once scheduled them for a vote. If one senator can place a hold and prevent a vote from taking place, then yes. What does the term void ab initio mean? means void from the time when it occurred, as if it had never happened. If these judges were not uh, constitutionally appointed via recess, would you agree that any decisions that they participated in would be void ab initio? If they were, in fact, not properly on the board, then, I, I mean, that'll be for the courts to determine. I wouldn't be surprised if the courts reached that conclusion. Well, they would have to, right? But, if they weren't judges, then, then they well, would Well, board members, yes. All right, last question. Uh, what is a recess? I've already stated I'm not prepared to give a definition of that at this time. I'm not an expert on congressional procedure. Well, what, what, I'm, what you, I'm here as a labor lawyer. What do you think would be a fair amount of time? Oh, who gets to decide whether the Senate's in recess or not? Well, ultimately, I suppose it will be the Supreme Court. But, but who according to the Constitution, who decides? Who decides whether or not the bodies are in recess or not? The, either uh, House has to consent to the other being in adjournment for more than three days, which was part of the, the issue here. But the D.C. Circuit's decision goes far beyond the question of whether these pro forma sessions uh, prevented a recess or not. The D.C. Circuit's decision would invalidate literally hundreds of appointments to all manner of uh, offices by Presidents Reagan, Bush, and uh, Clinton. And I <coughs> well, we'll have to disagree on the interpretation of the opinion. Congressman, time. Congressman, if, 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 if